Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this HCV Action webinar on measuring progress towards hepatitis C elimination in the UK. My name is Iona Castley, and I help to coordinate HCV Action along with my, co my colleagues Noah and Aidan. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. I think we're still waiting on a couple of people to join, but we'll get going because there's a lot to cover. We've got four excellent presentations for you to discuss various aspects of achieving and measuring hepatitis C elimination. First of all, we're going to hear from Mark Gillian Powell from NHS England to give the national perspective on what elimination looks like before moving to Professor John Dillon from NHS Tayside, who will talk through how Tayside became the first region in the UK to micro eliminate hepatitis C last year. Aaron Ludlow Rhodes from the Practice Plus group will then give an overview of their successes in prisons before Paul Vanter and Anna Buitendam from Public Health England cover how elimination can be measured and maintained using the Care Pathway dashboard. We'll have time for a few questions after the presentation, so please do feel free to type any questions you have into the Q&A or the chat box at any time during the presentations, um, and then I'll put them to our speakers once we've heard from all of them. We're going to be tweeting during the webinar using at HCV Action, so please do look us up and engage if you're on Twitter. And finally, I'd like to note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the HCV Action website and YouTube channel after the event. So I'm now going to hand over to our first speaker, Mark Gillian Powell, um, who many of you will know is head of programme for hepatitis C elimination at NHS England and NHS Improvement. So Mark, over to you. Thank you very much, Iona. Um, and thank you to um, HCV Action for um, uh, asking me to speak today. I'm just going to um, share my screen screen, hopefully share my screen with you. Um, you just bear with me. So can people see my screen now? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Yep, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so um, measuring elimination. Um, <sighs> This, is, this has been a kind of sore point for a few years. It's been um, at the point of some, of some disagreement. We've had um, up until now mostly um, indicators or targets that relate to um, some notional reduction um, based on you know, reduction from either our figures or international figures or World Health Organization figures. Um, and a number of them, so things like prevalence uh, or incidence, didn't um, didn't kind of treat you the same if you had um, a well-established harm minimization needle exchange based uh, system compared to a country that didn't, for example, and had very high rates of infection. It was quite easy for the, some of those countries to show um, 30% reduction in infections, it was much more difficult if you'd already had a very, a kind of very um, detailed and accessible uh, harm minimization system. So um, a number of um, professionals um, worldwide have been asking for the, the targets to be reviewed, um, and they have been, I'm very pleased to say. Um, so just very briefly, people will know this anyway, but obviously we're working um, on a shared goal of eliminating hep C as a major public health issue um, in advance of the WHO, WHO goal of 2030. So we, we're expecting to achieve that significantly earlier. Um, and NHS England have given a, 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 a target to, to do that by 2025. Um, however, the only way that we can do this is in close collaboration. There are so many parts of the system um, and parts of, um, and, and different players that we rely on to be able to actually get this delivered. Um, it's not something any one part of the system can do. Um, and we really do need to work together to, to eliminate the virus. This is where we're up to at the moment. So up until uh, the, the, the last data we had, which was for June, um, we've provided 60,000 treatments since 2015-16. Um, we've got a, a run rate for this financial year, 21-22, of 12,500, which takes us back to pre-COVID levels. 
Um, we're not doing too badly about uh, uh, with that at the moment, even though some of the services are still in, very much in recovery. Um, the last um, weekly report I had was that we were achieving um, in excess of 80% of our of our planned uh, run rate. So progressing well, obviously with some uh, some local differences about how well that's going. Um, so how will we evidence um, elimination? There are a, probably three um, significant main ways that, that we'll do this. Um, so local elimination, <coughs> um, we've had a number of different um, suggestions or approaches to micro elimination, which I'll come up, uh, I'll, I'll come on to. Some de detail of program narrative about what we did, how we did it and what was achieved. <coughs> and then the World Health Organization measures um, in relation to what's the evidence that you've um, eliminated hep C as a public health issue um, and have you maintained that over time? So it won't just be a single, here's the line in the sand you've eliminated. There are certain things, certain programmatic uh, measurements that we'll have to um, evidence uh, maintaining. Mark, just before you move on, could I just say, um, I don't think the slides are uh, moving on. I'm not sure whether your screen might have frozen on your laptop. Right, so I've got one that says, how will we evidence elimination? I think it's frozen. I'll share them from my side of things. Okay, I'll stop happen. sharing. Wonderful, thank you. Sorry, everyone, just bear with us for one moment. Is this one you're after, Mark? No, it was further up. That, 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 how will we evidence elimination? Perfect. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, local elimination um, uh, and, and evidence of micro elimination at a local level or at a, at a, a, a service level, program narrative and WHO measures. So we can move on to the next one now. So in terms of local or site elimination, so micro elimination, um, we've been basically when, when we started the prison program, the prison um, intensive test and treat or HIP program, um, we had to come up with some measures to say what we thought was reasonable for us to say we'd, we'd actually dealt with um, a prison at, at that point in time. Um, and so what we came up with was that 95% of prison and prisoners would have been tested in the last 12 months. 90% um, of those who'd been diagnosed positive of access treatment, because obviously we need to allow for the small number of people who say don't want treatment, don't want treatment yet, <coughs> and so on. Um, but also crucially evidence that reception testing provision is adequate. Um, and that was because what we didn't want to do is go in and test 95% of people, treat 90% of people, but still have um, an active population or, or a high churn into the prison of um, people with active um, hep C. Um, bringing that in um, and potentially um, uh, sharing that infection. <clears throat> so um, making sure the reception test testing is adequate. The only thing we've really got to go on is that the national section 7A performance indicator for um, reception testing is 75% uptake. Um, we're not actually at that point yet uh, in most cases. Um, in some prisons, we certainly are. In some prisons, we're at 0% uptake. Um, so very different positions, but we, we're going through all of that data to try to make sure that um, where prisons have done intensive test and treat or HIP programs, that we're meeting all of those, uh, all of those indicators. <coughs> and where we can evidence that um, from World Hepatitis Day onwards on the 28th of July, um, we'll be providing um, alongside HMPPS and the Hep C Trust um, certification for uh, microelimination in that establishment. Um, probation, um, similar to um, approved premises, similar to prisons in terms of testing rates. Um, but what we've asked 
for is some locally defined ongoing testing. So we've got a number of ODNs who are saying they're going to be going in on a quarterly basis um, because people aren't necessarily um, admitted into approved premises in the same way they are in, in, uh, in reception prisons in large cohorts. So um, we've got a number of ODNs now saying that they're going to do that, that approved premises testing on a quarterly basis. And we need to work out how to um, look at this with those who are on post-sentence supervision and those who are on community sentence treatment requirements. But obviously the probation service is um, changing at the moment to um, and, 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 and redeveloping to undo some of the work that was done when parts of it were privatised uh, a number of years ago. So that's going to take us a bit, a bit longer. Um, people who use drugs or who have used drugs. Um, we've got some addiction services who are developing site-specific elimination metrics. Um, so similarly, where they can evidence that over the past 12 months, a certain percentage or proportion of their um, existing population or their new population coming into, uh, into the service um, have been tested um, and referred to treatment. And then again, we, we need to look at other areas, whether there are other areas where we can demonstrate microelimination, such as um, amongst MSM or homeless populations. Um, next slide, please. So um, the long awaited updated WHO uh, uh, elimination metrics. Um, it's worth just saying that um, WHO are fairly keen for us to eliminate Hep B and Hep C, um, but at the moment I'm just going to concentrate on the right-hand column. Um, so the elimination of chronic Hep C infection is a public health problem. So um, they do still expect a reduction in incidence, um, uh, an eighty percent reduction based on the um, data that, that, that they have and a 65% reduction in mortality. Um, looking at the absolute um, targets in relation to that, so the numbers-based targets, um, they're expecting an annual incidence. So the number of um, new or reinfection cases that develop um, in, a, in a time period um, to be um, no more than five in 100,000 population. So we've got a very clear figure to, to aim for there. So no more than five in 100,000 population. Um, and there should be no greater than two, two, two people who inject drugs um, per 100 population um, becoming positive, uh, 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 becoming infected. And similarly with mortality, um, there's an expectation that we will get to um, two or less per 100,000 population um, dying in a set period of time. So um, that gives us a, a bit of distance to travel. Um, WHO estimated in um, 2015 that our share of the international uh, hep C related mortality was around eight in a hundred thousand. Um, we haven't had anything updated since then and we've got um, further data that we've got locally from PHE which we think is possibly more reliable than the WHO estimate um, but we need to kind of look into all of this. This only came out um, a week ago, so we need to look into um, where we currently match up against these uh, these data items. And then there are some programmatic uh, uh, targets. So greater than or equal to 90% of people with HCV diagnosed, um, greater than or equal to 80% of people diagnosed with H HCV are treated. Um, no unsafe injections, 100% blood safety, and at least 300, 300 needles and syringes per period per year, um, which I don't think we're meeting at the moment. And next slide. So we've already demonstrated some notable achievements. So over 60,000 treatments to date with around 98% cure. Reduced mortality by we reduced mortality by 20% in 2018. Um, 
the target was actually 10% by 2020. So we're already doing well with the mortality rates, but we need to see how that measures against the new uh, metrics. Um, and we know that liver transplants, hep C related liver transplants have halved in the last 10 years. Um, so we need to kind of review where we're up to and look at the targets and see how we can evidence um, our collective achievement across, um, across elimination. And next slide. That was just my details. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, that was really insightful and it's, it's great timing to have this event shortly after the World Health Organization guidance was published just a couple of days ago. Um, just to say, please do add any comments or questions to the chat box or to the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, and I'll make sure that they're answered at the end of all of the presentations. So I'm now going to pass over to Professor John Dillon, who is consultant hepatologist and gastroenterologist at NHS Tayside and is clinical lead for bloodborne viruses there, as well as being involved in research at the University of Dundee School of Medicine and chairing the Scottish Hepatitis C Action Plan. It's a pleasure to have you here today, John. Um, I know I'm sharing your slides, so I'll just get them up for you. Thank you very much, Iona, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be talking to you all. I'm going to follow on from where Mark's come from, from the high level um, point of view to what happens when you're on the ground in a sort of region trying to deliver it. So Scotland is divided into 14 health boards where we have a very old fashioned healthcare service. Those of you who lived in the 1970s might recognise it, but it means all healthcare is provided within that regional area. So I'm responsible for Tayside, which has a population of 416,000 people on the east coast of Scotland, and we cover a geographical area of about 40,000 square kilometres, so large geography, two cities and a lot of towns scattered through the area. So what I want to talk about is Hepatitis C in Scotland, recently arrived but soon to depart. Next slide please. So if we want to think about eliminating Hepatitis C, we need to think about the people that we're trying to reach. And the majority of people who have acquired hepatitis C are going to have acquired it through some form of drug use in the past. And so many of those patients are going to be stigmatized from the health service, have had adverse um, experiences of healthcare. And so their feelings and relationships with healthcare are going to be important. So we did this discrete choice experiment around hepatitis C testing and asked people how long they were prepared to wait for different services. So these were people picking up opiate substitution therapy and they were prepared to wait four and a half weeks to have the test done in their own pharmacy rather than to go somewhere else. Two and a bit weeks to have it done in their pharmacy with their pharmacist rather than having to go and make an appointment with their GP. Their own pharmacy or their drug worker, they were, prepared, they were equally valued those. And rather as a rather an indictment about my service, um, to be treated with respect, they were prepared to wait seven and a half weeks. So it just shows the choices and the barriers that we're trying to break down to reach people and bring them into care. Next slide, please. And the first part of that care is getting people towards a diagnosis and a test. And so that's the key part. Venipuncture is a specialist skill that's around doctors, some specialist nurses, etc. And so it normally involves moving the patient to somewhere where there is someone who can do venipuncture. And we lose many people in that journey. An alternative for um, hepatitis C testing is to think about dry blood spot testing, where um, the blue um, device in the bottom left hand corner of this slide is a lancet that you press the trigger, it jumps out and punctures the side of your finger. You then squeeze um, drops of blood onto the card. And from those drops of blood, you can get an HIV test, a hepatitis C antibody test, a hep C PCR and a hep B test as well. We can train anybody to get blood out of a fingertip. Blood out of a stone takes a little bit longer, but blood out of a fingertip, anybody can do. And therefore we have trained anybody and everybody who's involved in that pathway of care. So it means that the person who wants a hep C test or should be offered a hepatitis C test can be offered it where they are. They don't need to travel. So that could be a drug problem center, a community pharmacy, a homeless outreach environment, um, within the judicial service, so in prison or in drug treatment testing orders, needle exchanges, charities and volunteers are offering mobile and van services. So in Tayside, we now have over 300 
non-medical staff trained who can't do venipuncture and are doing DBS instead. So your chances of bumping into one of those people when you need a hep C test is quite high and we can get it done. So that makes a big impact and making it simple. What happens when you do that? Next slide, please. And of course, if you can um, do the test, you can read the test result and we allow you to refer. So you have the power of referral as well. So we take another set of barriers and steps out of the system. So from the person that we've trained, they can refer directly to my service. Next slide, please. So if you look at the blue bar, dark blue bars at the bottom of this graphic from and look at the change around 2008, 2009, this is when we started to train people to do DBS. In the, and the big change was within the drug and alcohol services. And you saw this big surge. Slightly later on, we trained the pharmacists to do it, and we saw that surge. So you see this big rise in the number of people that are being diagnosed. But I draw your attention to the fact that the rest of the bars, the other testing that was going on in the other sites, the conventional venipuncture, didn't fall. So we weren't swapping patients through to different pathways. We are reaching a whole new group of people that we had failed to reach before. And we were moving them all into, into, into engagement with care. So that DBS technology allows you to reach into different populations and to find them. Next slide, please. So what happens when you start to do that? Now, if you look at the um, bars on the left-hand side, um, this is testing in general practice. This is all antibody testing. And you can see that our colleagues in general practice have done 27,000 hep C tests within Tayside. And we're getting a 3% positivity rate, which is higher than we'd expect from population. So there's some selectivity. Myself and my colleagues in secondary care, we've done nearly 80,000 hepatitis C tests and our positivity rate is only 1%. If we look at our addiction services colleagues, they've done a couple of thousand tests and found a 12% positivity. Community pharmacists have done a few hundred and have found 11% positive. Our needle exchange colleagues have done about, about 2,000 tests and found 26%. And similarly, in our prisons as we move forward. So these specialist pathways where the DBS works have much higher positivity rates, but there's a lot less testing going on. Can we have the next slide, please? And if we look at that, clearly general practice and secondary care testing has been going on over a period of 30 years in Tayside, and this is accumulated data from over 30 years. And while the positivity rate is low, general practice has found a third of the patients, secondary care has found a third of the patients, and the other specialist pathways within drug treatment services, community pharmacies, et cetera, with much lower testing, have found another third of the patients. And so it's that combination of pathways. And if you look at what you find within those pathways in the needle exchanges, less than 1% of the patients are uh, cir cirrhotic, but in the general practice populations, 17% of them have cirrhosis at diagnosis. So you are reaching different pathway, different fractions of the population at different time points in the epidemic. So rather than having one pathway only, we need all of these pathways to reach across the whole community that we're trying to find. Go to the next slide, please. I've just covered that already. So this is the change in the different stages of disease that you find in the different pathways. And the next slide, please. So what does our, pro, uh, our pathway look like in Tayside? The dark brown splodge in the map on the right-hand side is the area of Tayside that I'm responsible for. So you can see it's about 12% of the geography of Scotland. It's about 8% of the population of Scotland. So on the left-hand side of this slide, we have the standard pathway. So it's someone in secondary or primary care suspects hepatitis C for some reason, does a test by venous blood and their treatment is provided with nurse-led clinics in a secondary or primary care environment. We have four specialist pathways within Tayside. In the pharmacies, if you are on opiate substitution therapy, they will perform dry blood spot testing for you. If you are positive and the pharmacist has been trained, he or she will then prescribe you treatment and monitor your treatment throughout so that you never leave the pharmacy. In pharmacies where the, they can do testing, but they can't, they haven't had enough experience to do treatment, a nurse in reaches and sweeps through the pharmacy and treats all of the people requiring treatment. 
In the drug treatment centres, the prisons and the needle exchanges, all the staff have been trained to do DBS or can do venipuncture. They are routinely offering testing and anyone who is positive is treated by an on-site hepatitis C nurse specialist who inreaches into those environments. So all of this is about minimising journeys and times to contact. And these journeys are often no longer than the office next door. But if you're not careful about how you manage that journey to the room next door, you lose people. And so it's important that, that it's not just geography. It's about that contact and helping the helping hand to take people around the corner to get them engaged, to break down those trust problems that I alluded to at the start. So that's what our treatment pathways look like in Tayside at the moment. Next slide, please. What happens when you start to do those? So between 1998 and 2021, we have found over 4,300 people to be hep C positive in Tayside. 18% of those are now dead, so they're no longer prevalent cases. 16% have moved away from our area. We have prisons in our territory that cover uh, other geographical areas, so that's the predominant reason for moving away. 23% were PCR negative after antibody testing, and so 43% of that group of patients are known to be alive and resident in Tayside at the moment, so they are our prevalent, prevalent cases. We know 87% of them have had an SVR, 5% um, of them are awaiting their SVR, 2% of them are beyond the SVR date, we're still waiting to track them down. We have 4% of them on treatment, and we have 4% of them waiting to go on to treatment to try and be tracked down. And we've lost about 1% of them that we just don't know where they are within that environment. These are figures from June 2020. Next slide, please. So if we're thinking about how close to elimination are we having done all of that, having treated most of the patients we've diagnosed, in Scotland, it's estimated that currently about 0.5% of the population are um, PCR positive for hepatitis C. So in Tayside, that will be 1,975 people. So our chronic prevalence would therefore, our 90% of our chronic prevalence would be 1,776. So we've ever diagnosed 4,308. This was June last year. PCR negative 980, non-resident 694, unfortunately died 664. So 1,970 alive and living in Tayside. So we found nearly all our prevalent cases if the estimated prevalence for Scotland is right for Tayside. And we have treated 1,813 of those patients. So again, that's over 90% of our chronic prevalence have been treated and achieved SVR. So by the old definitions of the WHO, we have made elimination criteria. Um, by the new definitions, I think we've probably still made it, but we might have to declare that all over again. What have we done specially about Tayside? Absolutely nothing. We have just done simple things, but done them efficiently and made sure they spread into all of the corners of our service across our territory. And we have a large geographical territory to cover with lots of sites of interaction. So it's a little bit more difficult for us. We have the advantage that all our testing is centralized. So we know where everyone has been tested. It makes it easier for us to track patients through the system, but that's what we've achieved. Next slide, please. Now, touching elimination is a transitory thing. You then need to keep elimination going. And therefore that comes as brings us onto the concept of treatment as prevention. So once you've achieved elimination or reached those targets, you need to carry on testing repeatedly to try and break down these networks. So this is a um, empirical social network of people who inject drugs and their relationships. So each dot is a person on this map and each line is a sharing relationship. So if we take the top line, can we have the next slide, please? This map is borrowed from a, a good colleague of mine in Australia called Mar Mar Professor Margaret Hellard. So we'll call the first case Bruce. Can we have the next slide, please? And Bruce is in a sharing relationship with Sheila and they're sharing drugs and sex. If we can treat Bruce before uh, he infects Sheila, we've got a 200% SVR. And the people who pay my drug bills like that idea. They treat one patient, they cure two. If we go down to the next slide, this is Gary. And if we treat Gary, if I had a time machine could go back and catch Gary after he was infected, before he started sharing down that network, next slide please, I would have an 8,100% SVR, which my payers really, really like. Now clearly I don't have a time machine and we can't catch Gary at that particular point, 
But if we have enough treatment episodes scattered through that large connect, that large network at the bottom right hand corner of this graph, we can break down those transmission lines and reduce the numbers of patients that become infected. And so as we move towards elimination, it then becomes important that we repeatedly test within all of those people who are high risk and offer them treatment as soon as we detect them. And we invite them to bring their friends along. And if that involves some vouchers, some food parcels, or any other bribery that you can think of that brings more people in for testing, use it. And that's what we do. So patients can have vouchers for going to ASDA, they can have food parcels, whichever they prefer. Um, the protein buildup drinks are particularly popular in the needle exchanges. So that's where we are in Tayside. Next slide, please. This isn't a solo effort. This is part of a team. And I'm grateful to the local team for providing support and for our international and national collaborators. Can I have next slide, please. This is some of the team. And the final slide, please. This is what happens to encourage them to work harder if they're not ho ho working hard enough. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the uh, other presentations. Thanks, thanks very much, John. That was really insightful. And as you say, even though things weren't necessarily done really differently from other services, it's it was fascinating to hear about how much the service was brought to the patient and how, how person-centered that approach was. So thank you very much. Um, please do keep your questions coming in the chat box. We'll cover them after the presentations if we've got time. We're running a little bit behind, so I'm gonna ask our next presenters to just be concise in your presentations. Thank you. So we're now going to hear from Aaron Ludlow Rhodes, who's the Regional Bloodborne Virus Delivery Nurse Manager for the Practice Plus Group, um, and who's also leading on health and justice for a number of prisons in England that have achieved microelimination. Uh, Nicola Royal, um, also a Regional Bloodborne Virus Nurse Manager, has joined us as well, um, and will be around to answer questions in the Q&A session after the presentations. Um, so the projects that Aaron and Nicola have been involved in were finalists for a Royal College of Nursing Award last year, and it'll be great to hear about the successes of that work and the tasks and challenges ahead. Thanks, Iona. Um, I'm going to ask you to share the slides, if that's okay, just given the uh, previous glitch, it might be a little bit easier. Um, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as you said, both Nicola and I um, work for Practice Plus Group. They provide healthcare in 47 prisons in England, which equates to around about 40% of the um, English prison estate. So Nicola and I oversee a team of nurses and nurse associates that in turn um, lead and oversee um, and support the BBV work across our estate. And then just before I move on, um, in collaboration with our partners at Gilead and uh, Gilead Scientists and the Hep C Trust, um, over the last two years, we've worked really hard with our sites to provide a specific BBV training, um, implement POC testing, so point of care testing, which gives sort of a relatively instant result so it can shorten that test to treat time, and also embed reception and referral processes. What that's led to is us being in a position now where we can start to microlate um, prisons. We've had several sites already uh, that we've microeliminated, and we aim to have at least 10 by World um, Hepatitis Day later this month. So what I'm going to do is talk you through how we've achieved this and how we've measured it. So again, just a quick refresher on the NHSE criteria. We just want to go through three points. So as Mark's already mentioned, that it's the 95% of that current population tested within the last 12 months. The 90% of those positives are treated or on treatment within a 12 month time frame, and that we have processes in place for quarterly reviews of uptake, reception testing and the need for assertive outreach. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we introduced across the regions, initially starting with the Midlands and then sort of subsequently rolling it across nationally, was a process that we call weekly manual data triangulation. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but basically what this process is, is a, a weekly process where sites submit their um, BBV data of the receptions that they've received. This in turn is then analysed and cross-checked against the patient records. In our prisons, the record system we use is called System 1. This not only ensures that the data captured is accurate, but it also enables um, the regional BBV lead nurse to identify sites and or individuals who may need additional support and resources, ultimately to increase their testing figures. Next point, please. What this is really supported is the embedding of that opt-out 
BBV testing approach. We are also confident because our data is checked regularly that it's accurate. Next slide, please. This slide just shows you the testing data across our prisons over the last year. If you look around about December, January time, this is when we rolled out that, the aforementioned process across all our sites. And what you can see is a gradual intake to leading to our best data in May 21, with 98.1% of our receptions being offered, uh, uh, our receptions who hadn't been tested within the last three, 12 weeks being offered a test. And of them, 85% of them were screened within seven days. So what we've then been able to do is create um, reports using system one. So when we record our BBV data, it's entered on a specific BBV template. And this data that entered is associated with what we call read codes. We can then build reports to look for these read codes. So some of the reports that we've built are one that shows of that current population who has been tested. That gives us the percentage. And of course, the magic number we're looking for is above the 95%. And this is only included of that last 12 months. We've then built a further two reports. One looks for anybody who's been on a DAA or currently on a DAA in a 12 month time frame, so the same time frame as, as the tested um, patients. We've also then built the further report that looks at anyone who's RNA positive but not on a DAA. And the final report combines all that data to give us that percentage. And again, what we're looking for is that magic number of above 90%. So this snapshot here is from HMP Featherstone who achieved this on the 21st of last month. Finally, what we're also able to do is then look at other reports um, to, uh, to identify patients that may need testing. We can also look at patients that need treatment. And again, as part of our weekly process, we can review these patients and ensure that's happening. So what that's led is to really high numbers of our patients or percentages of our populations have been tested. So we, we're edging ever closer to that microelimination. So what we decided to do is um, what we call targeted testing events. Now, targeted testing events can take many forms from adding extra clinics on during the working week, adding alerts onto notes so patients can be identified if they're at healthcare for other reasons and offered a BBV test by clinicians. We've coincided testing events with other wellbeing days. So recently at HMP Featherstone, they coincided it with Men's Health Week. We've had targeted testing days or targeted testing weekends, as well as assertive outreach and uh, work on the wings. The other thing that we've done to support, to support microelimination is HITS. So you're probably all familiar with the high intensity test and treat events. So this data below is of our most recent HIT, our most uh, successful HIT to date, and that's HMP Doncaster. So I know Nicola will be happy to talk you through the data a little bit more if needs be. But in essence, of that population during the testing event in May and during that week that we did the testing event, the eligible population was 1,100. Of that, we screened 1,085, so 98.6% of the population. We found 21 new PCR positives, and of that, we got 16 of them onto treatment, which was 76.2% uh, of that population. However, if we combine that with the patients that were already on treatment and patients that were previously pointed, uh, uh, treated in the last 12 months, that got us above the magic number of 90% further treated. So we was able to declare and apply for microelimination status for HMP Doncaster. So next slide, please. So challenges and barriers. So what for us, one of the biggest challenges is the maintaining of microelimination. Why is this? So next point, please, just one click. So first of all, it's time. We're confident in all our prisons, we've got some really, really slick processes. But even with this, from that time from the reception to the PCR, to the bloods coming back from the lab, to the referral, to the consultation, to the medication being delivered inside. All of that takes time, whether that be hours, days, or weeks. If you combine that with the next point, a lot of our busy prisons have constant throughput of receptions. So by the time we've treated patient A, we've had patient B and patient C. And if I just give you a real life example of that, one of my sites in the Midlands, HMP Drake Hall, achieved microelimination status earlier this year. As part of me reproposing them this week um, to be recognised for uh, World Hepatitis Day, they'd actually um, had a, a reception who was PCR positive. Now, whilst they've referred and they're waiting for the medication, currently that patient's not on that medication. So they've got nine patients that have been treated or eligible for treatment, but only eight of them have actually received the medication. So unfortunately, that's dropped their percentage to 88.9%. I'm really confident we'll get back above it, 
but it's that constant chasing our tail, so to speak, to keep above. But that doesn't um, put us off. And that's why we're really keen to work with all our partners and stakeholders to ensure that that time from test to treat can be as sim uh, simple and as short as possible. Mind of Varna, and it's a bit of a pipe dream, is that ultimately we can test and treat and initiate treatment within the prison so we can talk a matter of days um, rather than weeks. So all the challenges and barriers, as of course patients decline treatment, absolutely that's their right to do so. And um, we always try our best to educate our, our, our patients and use our colleagues and peers from the Hep C Trust. But unfortunately, some patients don't want treatment. Now, again, if we've got sites with quite low prevalence, so one or two patients that are positive and one individual who's declining treatment, again, it's really hard to get that figure above the 90%. But again, we continue, continually try. And finally, staffing. I'm not going to dwell too much on COVID because I'm sure we've all heard enough of it, but of course that's had a massive impact on us over these last 12 to 15 months. It's left sites um, often depleted of staff. I mean, lots of our colleagues at treatment providers have been redeployed. We've also seen some positive news from COVID. We've talked about telemedicine for a long time and remote clinics, and actually that's something we successfully did uh, throughout COVID. And moving forward, as we plan for recovery, it's about looking at what worked well during that time. Is there anything that we can retain and utilize moving forward to treat our patients? We've also decided or learned to be dynamic and flexible with our approach. So there's always competing demands within prison. But one of the things that we know we're doing is COVID testing or, or COVID vaccinations. So again, talking back to the targeted testing, actually, if we've got that patient in front of us, we're capitalizing on that and being creative to capture and ensure that those patients are being tested during that. So all in all, that's kind of what we're planning to do uh, on PPG and the work that we're doing. Thank you very much for your time and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Aaron. That's, that's really helpful overview of everything that you've clearly succeeded in massively. Um, so finally, we're going to hear from Paul Vanter and Anna Buitendam at Public Health England. Um, Paul is a senior epidemiologist scientist and leads on the ODN dashboard while Erna is head of quality improvement and quality assurance for blood safety, hepatitis, sexually transmitted infections and HIV. I just want to note before I hand over that some of the data in Paul's slides is provisional um, and not to be shared outside of this webinar, so please could I ask you not to tweet these slides out. Um, and Paul, if you wouldn't mind just keeping your presentation brief so that... Um, we have time for some questions at the end. I don't want to rush you through, I'm sure. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Sure, thank you. I know, I, I knew, I knew it's a beauty of being uh, in the last part of a, uh, any webinar. Um, I will do try to um, uh, glide through my slides and present everything to you, what we prepared with Erna. Um, just to maybe, uh, I, will, I will navigate myself, but I think I will stop the sharing camera with you for time being just because it may slow the, uh, my slides. Um, so um, again, good afternoon and thank you so much for inviting uh, me to talk to you today. I will now try to present you with a, a background concept and, and uh, um, the content of the dashboard, uh, ODN HCV uh, testing dashboard. Just can you confirm if you can see my screen or not yet? Uh, not yet, Paul. Not yet, sorry. Uh, I hope it's coming. That's perfect, thank you. Is it? Great. Um, so, yes, um, in terms of dashboard, uh, I, I will try quickly go through the background. And uh, here it's a great thank you to Mark, who already mentioned uh, most of the content of my first slide when I, was, uh, when I want to highlight the targets that we are all uh, working towards which are set up with WHO, and of course highlight the success that you already reached uh, um, in England uh, by reducing um, uh, HCV-related mortality, not only by 10, by 20, but by 20%, and it's already in, uh, was achieved in 2018. Um, so uh, we do have uh, uh, successes in our accounts, and, and for sure this is uh, uh, one of them. So on this positive note, and uh, to keep the momentum, uh, around that time, in 2018, uh, they came with the idea of creating a one-stop, real-time, um, local data dashboard type um, tool, which would help to um, 
uh, inform local efforts to improve uh, prevention, case funding, and treatment for HCV, and uh, monitor progress and support actions towards elimination and micro-elimination. And again, to echo what, uh, what Mark said already, um, the healthcare itself is a very complex uh, um, uh, have a very complex structure and, and dynamics. So we knew that when we started working on this dashboard, we knew that we need to take into account that there's several commissioners and many uh, providers along the care pathway for uh, HCV and the data that would come into this dashboard or to be a source of information for this dashboard would come from the multiple uh, sources. Um, the PHE position was quite Good at that point, and that's why PHE was appointed to to work on this on this dashboard, as we uh, provide the national and local intelligence data, and also uh, as a PHE we have this permission to collect PII of, uh, of patients' um, uh, PII details, and this is uh, crucial for uh, the duplication and linkage uh, for surveillance uh, purposes. So this is the rationale, and this is the background for for the dashboard and how uh, this idea came, uh, where, where this idea came from. Um, in terms of data sources, the starting point for our dashboard is um, uh, are all the testing activities. And these are taking place in various settings, in various sites, and all this uh, testing information is then processed by uh, NHS labs and PHE reference labs. And the data flows from, uh, from labs to PHE surveillance systems. Uh, one of them is SGSS, uh, second generation surveillance system, and then civilian, um, sentinel surveillance for bloodborne virus uh, diseases. So this is the, this um, testing and diagnosis component of, of the data which we collect in PHE. But the second uh, part of the second type of the data which we collect alongside is also uh, service provision, treatment, and outcome data. So this two different types of data put together are collected together in, at, at PHE. They give us uh, a comprehensive picture and a comprehensive uh, database for, for building up um, uh, this dashboard. Um, first dashboard was created in 2019 and it was an Excel uh, format document which contained about 50 pages with various tables and graphs, uh, uh, handling information, handling instructions and in also information about all the um, uh, civilian systems which uh, we took the data from to create this dashboard. Uh, currently in 2021 we are switching, we are in transition from uh, Excel to Power BI format and we believe that this new format will, as, as a much more dynamic, uh, will be also much more uh, user friendly and will allow uh, users to create their own um, outputs uh, because they will be able to slice, drill, and filter the data the way they need to uh, uh, to get to the uh, numbers that they need uh, from their perspective. Could you confirm, Iona? Is this yes. visible oh, in yeah. slide view? Lovely. So I'm Erin Bautzendam. I lead on quality improvement and quality assurance in the same division that Paul works in, and taking further the HCV service care pathway concept that we talked about. Um, it's another way in which PHE will try to work with ODMs to help support the elimination agenda. So on the left hand side of this slide, you see the data dashboard, the ODM reports, other national data sets, locally requested data that we will work with ODMs on local conversations to create a visual and logical sequential framework to present at ODN level uh, Hep C data that is collected through PHE. We hope that in a virtual workshop setting that will facilitate conversations between all the stakeholders in the ODN area um, to lead to action planning and lo local service improvement. Our uh, HCV service care pathway is not plucked out of thin air. We started originally looking at comprehensive case management for HIV infection, and we applied that to comprehensive case management in the chlamydia screening program. We looked at how across seven components of the chlamydia care screen, 
familiar scheming program, we developed a number of indicators across these seven components. And we then, per each upper tier local authority, collated the data and reflected up back to them in a pre-COVID non-virtual workshop. It was really still face-to-face. -face. We presented the data back to them. What does it mean? How it, does it look? What works well locally for chlamydia screening? What doesn't? What are your bottlenecks? And this slide on the bottom left shows you at a glance with using traffic lighting that the bottlenecks are here for this particular imaginary upper tier LA in terms of component five and six, which is the speed of which treatment can be initiated and how partner notification works. So we had these workshops across all regions in England, uh, very good patient, patient, very, very good participant feedback. And it's those principles that we've now started to apply to HCV care pathway. So acknowledging all the patient care pathways that patients come into a different HCV care pathway from different settings, whether that's drug and alcohol, health and justice, or outreach work with homeless communities, um, across any of those pathways that you've already seen in the previous presenters, presentations as well, there are data collection points. And these are the treatment databases, the surveillance databases that Paul mentioned, treatment, local information, and the unlinked anonymous monitoring survey for people who inject drugs. The ODN dashboard is what Paul referred to, and using those four data systems, it gives you a really comprehensive, in-depth data set for your local ODN and what that does. What we've now developed further is we add some local data and the data from the UAM survey to create a service care pathway at ODN population level. So it's no longer at patient level, it, this is a population level. Um, four components, prevention, initial screen, test and diagnose and treat and cure. And across those four components, we have a number of indicators that at ODN level that we present back to you. This started back in October last year. We started the consultation on what are the right indicators, the appropriate indicators to across those components of care to work with. And we consulted with internal and external stakeholders. In January, we started planning, let's pilot this with a local ODN. How does this land? Is this workable? We did the data preparation from February onwards. And then in April 21 this year, we had a pilot workshop with uh, Nottingham. And the feedback overall was very positive. It was really, I think, appreciated by the participants that all the different stakeholders were represented. We had the acute trust, we had the drug and alcohol services, we had representatives from health and justice, Hep C trust, uh, Gilead was there. So we had across the range of stakeholders was presented and it was really nice to look at that sequential framework of indicators what seems to work well for ODN Nottingham. We had technical issues, uh, no shying away from that, we had trouble doing the breakout rooms and getting people in the right room and facilitating that improvement discussion. However, based on the feedback from Nottingham ODN manager, ODN lead, the participants and facilitators, we have now moved on to this um, sorry, previous one, latest version of the service care pathway. I hope you can see that. We've got four components from top to bottom, eight steps in these components. So we do focus here on prevention quite a lot. Uh, we look at number of people screened for anti-HTV, number of people testing positive, then we move to RNA testing, making diagnosis, treat and cure and monitor, uh, including reinfection rates if we can. So this is already, uh, it's still very much draft. Please don't take this as, as this is what's going to be. Um, we're still going to consult on this one. We're going to run another pilot workshop, uh, but this is already much more streamlined than what we had in Nottingham. In Nottingham, we had five components and 32 indicators. We're now down to four components and uh, 21 indicators. So we're still working on it. And we've also now planned a, a better way of um, delivering a virtual workshop. So hopefully the next pilot workshop will be um, 
you know, even more beneficial for the participants. And we hope that this tool together with the ODN dashboard, which provides that, that much more detailed level of information that you need locally, that these tools will help you in your um, elimination agenda. So that's uh, my quick opportunity to uh, brief you on our further developments at PHE to help you uh, with your local quality improvement work. I'll now hand back to Iona for the Q&A session. Thanks thank very you very much. much. Thanks, Anna and Paul. Um, and thank you to all our panelists for their presentations. Uh, I have to apologize, we're running slightly behind. So um, it would be great if we could continue for just a couple of minutes, but I understand if any of the panelists need to leave for other commitments, that's totally fine. But if you can stay around, it will be great to have you. Um, we've got one question actually following straight on from um, what Erna was saying just then that I might put forward first um, from Duncan, which is asking, will the Public Health England dashboards provide local prevalence estimates um, so ODNs can identify how close they are to elimination? Um, Duncan was saying that the last prevalence figures he had seen were from 2017. And I don't know whether you'd like to lead on that one. Um, oh, sorry, I'm on mute, I think. Am I on mute? No, nope, we can hear you loud and okay. clear. <laughs> um, I think we will try, but I can't say for the moment that that is definitely uh, one of our options yet. I think uh, we'll talk with Monica and Mark uh, what that would could possibly look like. Mark, Mark would you like, would you to, like to add to that? Yeah, just briefly, we. We did have a look at the um, prevalence by ODN um, when we were looking at setting the, the treatment run rates for 21-22, uh, but I think it really, looking at the national um, prevalence was, was one thing, but once we tried to kind of stretch the model, if you like, to do that at a, at a much more local level, at a much more ODN level, um, it seemed less it seemed less applicable to what we already knew about the ODNs I suppose um, it seemed to be stretching the model too far so we didn't actually utilize the the ODN level did data in the end um, because it just seemed too too removed from from our experience of what the ODNs are able to find at the moment so we might need to do something completely different to get local prevalence okay thank you thank you both um, and then just one more question that I can see open is, I know Mark, you initially already responded to is from Aidan, um, asking whether speakers could provide their perspective on how much of a barrier the elimination, two elimination reinfections are to people who have received treatment um, and then have become infected again, and how this can best be measured and captured, um, and also what can be done to reduce them. I don't know whether any of the other speakers would like to um, add their reflections, their experience of this, of reinfections? No, I'm happy to sort of kick off. Um, I think it's a bit of an unknown entity at the moment. We've had a really challenging year, and I think just talking specifically from a tourism perspective, we know that the prevalence of, of hep C is generally amongst our, our uh, clients with a history of injected drug use, all those clients that are on OST. And across our present estate over the, the COVID pandemic, we've seen a 60% reduction, um, a very crude sort of uh, study that we looked at. So we kind of also know that in communities um, the provision of needle exchanges probably hasn't been as good as, good as it has been so I guess as we kind of go through recovery courts start opening back up we're probably going to start to be able to give a more accurate idea on that data I guess the difficulty is it's about looking at that historic data and I was on a call um, a few weeks back and I think the only common denominator would be an NHS number so for us in a prison estate, it would be looking at patients or building a report or, or pulling codes that have had a PCR positive code, followed by a subsequent um, negative code, and then followed by a, a, a subsequent positive RNA code. But again, that's only dependent on our systems having all that information. Um, so I think it's definitely one for us all to think about is how we can get that, that more accurate picture. Of, I can add to this uh, comment mm. as well. Um, we are looking at, at, at some algorithm how we could identify possible reinfections and uh, we are planning to add this indicator into the dashboard uh, when we 
find the visible way of of identifying this uh, these cases. So yeah, the works are on this as well, and we do want to cross check this uh, this this um, findings with with audience. So there's uh, the room for for um, further development. That, that's really great to hear because we've actually had through our HCV action survey quite a lot about reinfections and the need for this to be addressed if services are going to reach elimination. Our, that, that survey actually is closing on Friday, so I'll put a link to it in the chat box. Um, and I'd also be grateful if any uh, attendees could just fill out a really quick survey, uh, feedback survey for this webinar as well. Um, that's just gone into the chat, thank you. Um, so I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody. I think we should probably round up now because I know we're running five minutes late. Um, but thank you for everybody to attending and to all of our speakers for a really excellent and insightful round of presentations and brief discussion at the end. Um, as I said before, the webinar is going to be uploaded to YouTube shortly, um, which you're very welcome to share with your colleagues. And in the meantime, um, I'll be grateful if you could fill out the, the survey and also the, um, the feedback form, which I'm just popping in the chat as well here. Um, so thank you to everybody and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.